Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name's Carl. I'm an alcoholic. I paid those guys for cheering for me over there. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, Ralph. I am, uh, technically, I am the stand-in for Howard, my grand sponsor who passed away about six weeks ago. And then they juggled some things around, and so I'm three instead of 11, and uh, I'm grateful to be here this morning. And Hilda, I love listening to you. I could still be listening to you right now. I mean, she's the type where you laugh from the bottom of your soul when you are... Uh, and uh, great to meet you. Great to meet you, Tarek. Love it. And uh, Pat, Pat. Pat's not here. Where the hell is Pat? I set that up on purpose to point that out. <laughs> His girlfriend is very attractive. I imagine that's where he's at. <laughs> I'm not, not judging, just reporting. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> just observing. <laughs> so anyway, I could sum up what my job is today uh, to uh, discuss, uh, first of all, alcoholism, but in particular, step three. Um, there, if, if I'm supposed to be finding a place to turn my will and life over to that represents the care of God... I can literally sum it up with this. There is no better representation of the care of God for an alcoholic than Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. <clears throat> That's really it when it really boils down to it. But I know that, that like when I was new and they would read the steps and they'd come to step three, made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood and I didn't know in my mind I was quoting the book, you know, right after the ABCs where it says, you know, what do, what, do they, what do we mean by that and just what do we do? That's what I would have wanted to stand up and say at the meeting when I was new. When I heard that, I would have wanted to stand up. And, I, of course, I never would have. I was too, uh, you know, I just was, I, I was scared and uh, didn't really, you know. And so I, I, if I would have, could have, I would have said, what do you guys mean by that and what do you want me to do? Because it... It seemed a little bit like an altar call. You guys know what I mean? Come on down here. We're get, turn your will and life over to the care of... You know, we've all been warned that AA might be a cult. Haven't you heard that? I mean, even the people that love you, that are really glad you're sober and absolutely dumbfounded that you're sober, after they see that you're going to like three meetings in a day, they say, look out. Uh, don't go too far with this. And here's the disprove, you know, it's really easy to disprove that, you know, we're not a cult. Because a cult asks the potential new person, this is what they ask of them. Give up all your worldly possessions. And don't talk to anybody else other than us. So that's what a cult asks. Give up all your worldly possessions. And do not speak to your family and loved ones anymore. That's what the cult asks. Alcoholics Anonymous says to the potential new person, <clears throat> uh, we know you don't have a goddamn thing left. <laughs> <laughs> not a thing. And your family will not speak to you. <laughs> Come in here with us. We'll teach you how to talk to your family. And maybe in between meetings, you'll get a couple of things back. We're not really sure. Maybe, maybe not, and it might be a long time. Right, but if I could have stood up and said, what do you mean by that, and what do you want me to do? You know, it, because you're, the, the, you're saying turn two intangible things, will and life. These are words that kind of float out there and not really tangible. Like, you know, what I mean by that is this is my phone. It is in my hand. Right? But if you're saying... You know, my will and my life, those are words that I, what do you really mean by that? You see, if you would have said, uh, young guy there uh, uh, pointing at me, 
turn your car and your clothes over to the care of God as you understand them, I would have said, okay, I kind of get that. I would have left the meeting. I would have push started my car. I had to I have to <laughs> wiggle it with a screwdriver in, this, in the steering column at the same time and, and push start. It's really quite a, quite an, a feat to get that done. I would have push started the car. I would have gone down the, the street to a church because I guess that's where God is. It, you know, as a child, that's kind of what I was told. Um, I would have knocked on the door. I would have, the pastor would have answered and I would have said, well, I'm in AA. They said I need to turn my car and my clothes over to the care of God. I guess this is where God is. Uh, here is the screwdriver. You need the screwdriver here uh, to start the car. There's a few other things you need to know about it, but we'll get to that later. I would have taken off my leather pants, my leather jacket, my Metallica t-shirt, and, <laughs> and I would have uh, uh, put it there. The, the pants probably could have stood there on their own. <clears throat> I actually, and I, I dress that way quite often. Uh, a friend of mine told me at that point in my life I had IRS problems. Uh, that's imaginary rock star is what that is. Because to dress like that, you either have, you have to have two things going on. You either have to be, you should be making money as a musician, or you should have a motorcycle. I had neither one of those two things going on. <clears throat> Right, so I, the pants could have stood there on. I would have walked and I left and walked back to the meeting naked, feeling stupid. But I could have come back here and, here and said, <clears throat> "I did what you asked me to do. Now what?" Right? But you're telling me some very intangible stuff, and I'm going to uh, get to that in a little while. Uh, the main thing is that I love to talk about alcoholism, and I'm going to get to... See, we all need to have a deep and profound rearrangement of attitudes and ideas. That's actually the only way out of this that I have found. I know that medical science gives a, a, always takes shots at us. They really do. They, they give it their best. They really, and we're even polite in our book. There's no such thing as turning a normal drink, an alcoholic into a normal drinker. Science may one day accomplish this. We're kind of... Politically correct and say science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet, and it's a very nice thing to say. But I believe it's impossible. Medical science uh, always misses the mark because their hypothesis, their basic theory, is wrong. <clears throat> they assume we want to be a normal drinker. I have no interest in normal drinking. And because you may not know this, but normal drinking I hear <clears throat> is two drinks and stopping. <laughs> that idea just makes me nervous. It, it, I would just as well have you just scrape that chalkboard with fingernails as giving me two drinks and cutting, right? So the the basic theory. So no matter what science you do on top of the faulty theory, it doesn't matter. Anything that's going to limit me is useless to me. So the only thing that medical science could come up with that might interest me, somebody like me, is if they came up with a pill and they said, uh, <clears throat> Carl, if you take this pill, you can drink for four days straight. You can smoke as much cocaine as you want and nobody will go to jail. <laughs> nobody will go to the hospital, and your mother will still be very proud of you. <laughs> now that would turn my head. Then I'd say, now we can have a conversation. Right? But until then, limit me, stop me from... Mm. And also, if I'm new in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm trying to identify, this is such a beautiful crowd to, to, to really lay down the idea. We are a huge, wide cross-section of society, so our stories are very, very different. Every single race, creed, color, religion is part of Alcoholics Anonymous. This conference, better than most, really represent that. You go into Ohio and, you know, it's like kind of pretty much they all look... Well, they are cousins. I, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing... I'm teasing. <laughs> but man, especially Southern California, you just drive 15 minutes and you see the wide diversity of Alcoholics Anonymous. I love my friend Jackie who's here from Covina who says, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is the only society where the bank president, the bank teller, and the bank robber are all right here in the same room. <laughs> right? It really is a, it's a huge wide... And so if you are trying to identify and, you, and thinking you need to identify with people's background... You're going to miss the boat an awful lot. 
right? And on top of that, we drink differently than each other. We really do. If you listen closely in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will see that we drink differently than each other. To illustrate that, let's imagine, uh, we, uh, imagine this. To illustrate how differently we drink, uh, we crack open these back doors and we wheel in this giant cart of all the kinds of booze we all love, right? And if you're a top shelf expensive drinker, we got it. Remy Martin, Cavassier, we got it. If you're a bottom shelf drinker, we got that too. Mad Dog 2020. I, I know. Right? Yeah. It's usually the guy in the back that claps or salivates, but Candace goes right for it. Like, you know. Right. <laughs> and everything in between. And if we all took a good four or five stiff drinks, real drinks, no umbrellas in there, no mixer, four or five stiff drinks, you would see that we all drink, we all react quite differently, right? That over in this corner, we'd have the good time crowd. Ah, ha, 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 fun, 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 drink, 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 ah, ha, fun, fun, talk, 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 add a little methamphetamine, talk a little faster, talk, 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 right? We're having a good time in this crowd, in this corner. Over in that corner, we'd have the sobbers. You know them, they get a little drunk. <laughs> Over in this corner, we got the fighters, right? Get drunk, got to fight, got to fight. Over in this corner, a bunch of us would be naked. <clears throat> I personally would be visiting the other three corners trying to find a couple of friends to come over here with me. <laughs> Just the way I get. It, uh... So our stories are different based upon which corner we're drinking in, right? Over in the good time crowd, they get a lot of DUIs. Right? Always out there on the road, uh, another bar, got to go to the next bar, uh, next party, next party, after, who's picking up the booze for after hours? We're going to Joe's house, right? So out there driving a lot, they get arrested, DUIs. Over in the sobbing corner, they don't get arrested. They don't even leave the damn house, right? <laughs> the worst thing they do is call you at 3 a.m. <laughs> or God forbid these days, drunk Facebooking. <clears throat> believe that technology can record your blackout <laughs> exactly and there for life just some information there <clears throat> over in the fighting corner their stories already have probation parole mom paying for bail again court dates right over in this corner children show up by surprise <clears throat> that'll change your life drunk or sober right so our stories are different based upon what corner we're drinking in, but there's one thing, no matter which corner we're in, there's one thing we would all be doing. We would all be back at that cart for another drink. It was really important for me to understand that when I was new in order to identify. And you know what? This idea of this spiritual path we need to go on, this process we need to go through to recover from alcoholism, it it takes on a million forms also. And I don't know what your path is going to be, but there are some very similar characteristics in each one of our paths. But just like the way we drank, there is all sorts of color that surrounds some very basic things that need to happen. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, a little bit later. Now, I, I, uh, I think that uh, in these formats, of these Woodstock formats, they are going on all over the country, right? All over the country. And I got to tell you, if some, if some people are doing like nine and 12 of them. A little while, I was doing like five and six of them a year. And I got to tell you, it is a, it's a tough weekend, right? Sitting there the whole, because you got to be polite. And, but <laughs> you really do. You got to be polite and sit through 13 speakers, God damn it. <laughs> back to back to back. Just teasing you. So there's one thing that when we're talking about steps is that... I really need to make sure you understand that I have, I have to prove to you that I am overwhelmingly unqualified to talk about spiritual matters. It's really important for you to understand that I'm an alcoholic, otherwise we're not Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. If we are not talking about our stories and who we are, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is. It says our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, not what our most recent theory about a particular step has been. Oh, yes, absolutely. We're supposed to throw that, throw that out there and direct our attention towards that. But I'm supposed to, if, if I'm participating in Alcoholics Anonymous, I need to make sure that you know that I have n no right 
or any qualifications to be telling anybody anything. And that's what saved my life. I had been put, I had really, really good, well-meaning parents who had access to not only therapists, psychiatrists, and ministers, and all the best that society has to offer to try to intervene on me. And then another uh, federal agency uh, put me in front of a whole bunch of people like that, too. And, and there, I could not hear a thing. But then I get here to Alcoholics Anonymous and some guy that absolutely... Not a single letter behind his name, but ab- told a story. I just sat there, and I almost fell out of my chair in connecting with what he had to say. And it happened again this morning. I'm quite a bit older than Pat. I'm sober almost as long as he's been alive. And he knocked me out of my chair again this morning with the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's been happening to me ever since I got here. I seem to have a horrible relationship with alcohol right from the get-go. I cannot drink successfully. I cannot not drink successfully. I'm in the ultimate catch-22. I, uh, when I drink, I crave. You know, what happens to me when I drink alcohol is completely different than whenever I touch anything else. Whether, you know, is, alcohol is completely different than this glass of water for me, right? Over the next 45 minutes to four hours that I'm talking with you, I will probably drink... <laughs> this glass of water. But after I drink this glass of water, I am not going to go get a case of water and lock myself in a motel room. (laughs) Right? It's not going to happen. But at the very same time, so I I cannot drink successfully, but I cannot not drink successfully. Right? This is the part that just confused and broke the heart of everybody that loved me, cared about me, counted on me, or had authority over me over any period of time. And this is the part that I don't know how to explain it to you, I don't even know how to explain it to myself. But sooner or later, when I do not on my oven by myself and I do not drink for a day, a week, or a month, I seem to have a mind that will always, always rationalize and justify my walk back to the next drink at all costs. And I've had this relationship with alcohol ever since I first started drinking. I grew up, uh, I got to Seattle when I was nine years old, I do have to say. I, I, for the, one of the first times, I, I have somebody that I've known since fourth grade in the room. Her name's Sally, right here. She grew up just right down the street from me in Seattle. Uh, <sighs> typical morning for me in seventh grade, Marcus Whitman, junior high. <clears throat> Yay. <laughs> typical morning for me in seventh grade, I'd show up early for school, not for study hall or anything, but to meet my new friends at the very edge of the school property. Loser's Corner, the <laughs> stairs. Yeah, Loser's Corner. Yeah, and we would show up and all the kids would be out there smoking cigarettes trying to look cool we would also have what I like to call the playground cocktail that is a jar full of whatever we could rip off out of the parents liquor cabinet the night before and that jar is scary because nobody had been to bartending school yet so there's whiskey, vodka, cream to mint, vermouth all in that same jar you can imagine 6 or 7 of us 11, 12 year olds handing that jar around and <coughs> choking that down at 7 in the morning of course it was the early 70s so we're smoking that commercial pot Anybody remember that stuff? Four-finger lids, $10 a bag, seeds and stems and the whole bit. And it was even before zip, Ziploc baggies were invented, when it would just be a regular Glad sandwich bag. And as you'd roll it up, there'd be like nine people spin out. You'd go, oh, man. <laughs> we'd pack all those seeds and stems and leaves into a homemade pipe, maybe made out of plumbing fittings and a screen. Or if we're really desperate that morning, it would be a toilet paper roll with aluminum foil and pinholes in it. Were you guys there, too? Yeah, that's why you're here. It's also, and I, I, I love the way Pat alluded to, Pat's still not here. Um, I love the way Pat alluded to this, you know, the, the idea of singleness of purpose. Vitally important, so very important concept of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we never, ever, ever want to forget that Alcoholics Anonymous is about recovery from alcoholism, period. But in an attempt to protect that or to seem like they're protecting it, Quite often, speakers will interrupt themselves at points like this and say something like this. I don't mean to offend anybody, but drugs are a part of my story. The most bizarre example of that I've ever seen, it was a number of years ago. It must have been back in the 90s. I was at a big West L.A. speaker meeting, and the speaker that night was just giving one of the most ugly, heinous, blow-by-blow drunkologues I've ever heard. And i got to tell you, when I'm in a speaker meeting and I 
am uh, listening to the speaker and the, and the drunkalogue starts to get ugly, the uglier it gets, the more excited I get. And I think that night I was on the edge of my chair drooling, going, yeah, buddy, go, go, go. <laughs> and at one point in this really ugly story, this guy said, you know, I, I had four DUIs and the judge said, if I get one more DUI, I'm going to prison for sure. And he says, two weeks later, I'm on the freeway in a blackout and I hit a family of four. The family wound up in the hospital, and I wound up in prison. In prison, I sodomized men. I was sodomizing. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I did some drugs, too. <laughs> like, okay. <clears throat> By the time I'm 14 there in Seattle, I'm the neighborhood drunk. I'm the neighborhood pot dealer. I forgot to mention, but my father was a neighborhood Lutheran minister. I know. I know. And this sums up my teenage years. Sums up my teenage years. My vocabulary through my teenage years were the following. Whoa. Wow. Got the concert tickets, man. Right? That's it. That is the sum total of my teenage years. By the time I was 22, this little story I'm about to tell you will let you know exactly where I stood with my family. Now, my father was Swedish, my mother is Icelandic, therefore I look like a polar bear. And by the time I was 20, uh, uh, see, at Christmas time, my parents would not just send out Christmas cards to their friends and relatives. My parents would send out this big, long Christmas letter that said everything the family had been doing that year. And when I was about 22, I got a hold of one of these letters that had been sent out the previous Christmas, and as I read it, it let me know exactly where I stood with my family. Now, the first paragraph talked about what, the, what my parents had been doing that year. Another impressive year, I'm sure. The next paragraph talked about what the Morris children had been doing that year, and that paragraph went something like this. Our oldest daughter, Christina, just graduated from Cornell University in Ith Ithaca, New York, with a master's degree in human resources. She's now working for a large pharmaceutical company in the Midwest. She traveled to Europe this summer. She saw this, she saw that. Her hobbies are this, this, and this. She's a very happy young woman. We are very proud of her. Our oldest son, Eric, just graduated from Western Washington State University with a degree in marketing. He's now working for a large advertising firm here in downtown Seattle. He loves the golf. He loves to travel. He's engaged to be married to this wonderful woman named Mary Lou, who works for a very small company here in Seattle named Microsoft. <clears throat> they were small at one time, and they love to golf together. They love to travel together. He's a very happy young man. We are very proud of him. Our youngest son, Carl, just turned 22. <laughs> actually being very kind. <laughs> Long story short, it really would take till breakfast to describe everything that happened next over the next nine months to a year, and that is, uh, I, uh, well, I just, I just condense it down to one sentence. A really bad night happened, so I joined the Navy. Um, what I'm about to tell you uh, should concern you if you care anything about the security of the United States, <laughs> but on my way into the Navy, I passed a potential test. It's called the ASVAP test, and this test that I took qualified me to become a nuclear engineer. That should concern you that the United States Navy would have any type of system in place that even maybe possibly or even remotely would allow somebody like me near anything nuclear. However, they made me take another test when I showed up at that base for boot camp, and I could not pass that particular test. That test is called a urinalysis test is what it's called. <laughs> Should have been kicked out of the Navy series of events. Uh, I was allowed to stay in the Navy. Uh, I, they took away that nuclear status thing. I was now uh, put into the elite force of nuclear waste, is what they called us. <clears throat> Conventional electrician. And I, I got to tell you, uh, I meant to do well. I really wanted to do well. And it was obvious that I was in the Navy. I couldn't deny that. I mean, it was obvious. All I had to do was look at my surroundings on any given day. By God, I'm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I'm on a large gray ship, and I am wearing a uniform. No doubt about it, I am in the United States Navy. However, I would take a drink. That ship would pull into a port, and I'd take a drink, and I would literally would forget that I'm in the Navy. And there's something that's happening at this point in my life is that I am triggering off these three-day drunks 
by accident. And I'm only saying by accident, meaning I'd, I have had three-day runs and three-day drunks before, and I would plan them. I knew how to get there. I knew how to get the right combination, and I love, I love the second day of a drunk. I really do. People that have never experienced the second day of a drunk really haven't lived. They're really, they're missing out on some of the most, I don't know, uh, exciting days. And there's, there's this, there's also, there's a level of gratitude in the second day of a drunk when you haven't had a drink in like four hours and you just stand outside that liquor store and just the sound of the store owner's keys as they come across the click, 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 click and you're like, oh, right? There is, there's, and, and what these are, the, it's not that I'm drinking straight through these three days, but I am in and out, right? I might sleep for two hours or you might call it passing out and then I get up and I just take another little bit and it just fires it right back up. That's what I'm talking about. And they, they are starting to happen by accident. And I am drifting in and out of, out, of, uh, out of these blackouts for days at a time in the Navy. And it's a very strange feeling. When you come out of one of these three-day drunks and you find yourself on a large pier at 6 a.m. in a foreign country. <clears throat> and I'm going... <clears throat> There was a destroyer here the other day. <clears throat> the Navy calls that missing ships movement. They frown on this behavior because now they have to somehow figure out how they're going to get you to the ship, which is now back in the ocean, right? They have to send a helicopter or they have to transport you back to your home base and then you have to sit there and wait in shame for your ship to finally come back from being out. It's a serious thing. And I did that twice. I'd been in the Navy about two years uh, on this next thing, and uh, I, I, it was, it was, I came to a, in a cheap motel room in San Diego on a Monday morning, and again, I'd, I'm coming out of a three-day drunk, and I'm late getting back to the ship, and I'm already in a lot of trouble. My car is held together by rubber bands and the age-old saying my car was dying of alcoholism along with me. And I'm, and I'm late getting back to the ship, and I'm trying to get back, and one of the tools for living I got at this point is I would always save a pint for the end of the drunk. I knew how to do that. You save a pint for the end of the drunk, and I would get that half a pint in me as I'm driving back to the ship, and I'd stash the other half a pint underneath the seat. At noontime, I can run off the ship back to the, the parking area and drink that other half a pint. It's my way of sliding into Tuesday, I guess. And I, this, morning, this particular morning, I'm paying more attention to getting that half a pint in me than where the car is going. And at the front of every Navy base, there is a guard shack uh, where a Marine stands duty. Uh, they're pretty serious about this also. And uh, under normal circumstances, you are supposed to slowly and politely pull your car up to this guard shack. And you're supposed to uh, pull up and show him your military ID. He'll check the sticker on your car. If everything's in order, he'll allow you to proceed onto the base. This particular morning, as I said, I was paying more attention to getting that uh, half a pint in me than where the car was going, and all of a sudden I remember seeing the, seeing the uh, Marine had his head out of the guard shack, like, and I was wondering what he was so excited about, and I looked down and I saw I was still going 40 miles an hour. I tried to swerve. I yanked the, the, the wheel, and the car hit this meeting on the right-hand side and flipped over and bang, right through that guard shack. I could still see that Marine doing this big dive out of there. And he did a quick somersault. He was back up, weapon drawn. Thank God those guys are in good shape. Thank God they're in good shape. And it was one of those mornings where everybody's angry, right? Everybody's running around in circles. They're all pointing at me, and I'm just kind of, what, 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 what? God, I hated those mornings. The Marine was all right. Uh, they're patching me up at the hospital for minor injuries, and they're reading new charges on me. And there is nothing significant about new charges. New charges, new charges just happens in a guy's life like mine about every 90 days if you're living the way I'm living. There was nothing significant about that. But the most significant thing that happened that morning is the Navy doctors prescribed this stuff called Anabuse for me. I always love the groans and the laughs. I was now under orders to show up at sick bay every single morning and sit there, and I'd have to stick my tongue out like that, and the corpsman would put this little white pill on my tongue and make me sit there for half an hour to make sure it actually ingested in my system. Over the next seven to ten days, I started to experience the most cunning, baffling, and powerful side of this thing we call alcoholism, and that is I had no alcohol in my system, and I was literally going insane. 
See, when you take alcohol away from me and you do not substitute that with the center of Alcoholics Anonymous, something happens to me that I never had the vocabulary for, I never understood it, and I could not express that to you. Ever since I'd been a young teenager, somebody would take alcohol away from me, some wrecked car, some incident, flunking out of college, uh, another accident, getting busted for dealing drugs. Um, The Navy now is getting very angry and yanking alcohol away from me. It's always happened that they would take alcohol away from me. And then the well-meaning or people that love me or people who had authority over me would always put me in front of a group of somebody. Sometimes a few people, sometimes just one person. These people were always well-meaning. They were always highly educated, right? It would be some sort of counselor, therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, or a pastor of some sort. And they all would always have their own sort of way of saying the following. Sometimes they were aggressive in the way they said it. Sometimes they were gentle. Sometimes they were thoughtful. But they all wanted to know one thing. They would, in their own way, say, what's the matter with you? As if I, as if I could answer that. If I would have had the vocabulary, if I would have had the vocabulary, I would have said something like this. I would have said, yes. Especially like when the police are yelling at you, what's the matter with you? You know, why did you do this? You know, and everybody's angry. I would have responded with this. Yes, I know. I know it looks like the price for my drinking is getting high. I know. I get it. I agree. I don't like the fact that the car is on fire either. I'm with you on that. I see the problem too. But if you knew how I felt when I wasn't drinking, you wouldn't be asking me why I drink. And I did not... I didn't understand that I was defining my alcoholism right there. I, within 10 days, I just uh, I, I snapped and I went AWOL from my ship and I locked myself in a little, uh, self in a middle, little motel room in downtown San Diego, the Plaza Hotel. It's on 4th and Broadway. And uh, I had uh, 10 days worth of antibuse in me. And I remember sitting on the edge of the bed, and I had a bottle of vodka and a shot glass sitting there. And I remembered that the Navy doctors had given me a very stern warning about drinking on top of antabuse. They had said, son, you need to understand that if you drink on top of this antabuse, you will get one of two reactions. One reaction is you will get violently ill. The other reaction is you might die. I remember looking at the bottle, and I thought, well, wonder which reaction I'm going to get. And I took one shot, and nothing happened. Authority had lied to me again as far as I was concerned. I waited about two minutes just to make sure, and I took another shot. All of a sudden, I felt tingly in the face, so I looked in this cracked little mirror that was in this hotel room, and I was bright red, blotchy and purple in places. Hmm. Took another shot. All of a sudden, I could feel my heart going boom, boom, boom. Looked at my shirt. I was drenched in sweat, and all of a sudden, I was like <gasps> hyperventilating. <gasps> We're doing all right so far. You guys are really sick if you think this is funny. (laughs) And I took another shot, and up it came. My second sponsor was a man named Eddie Cochran, who was one of the pioneers of Southern California Alcoholics Anonymous. He died in 1999 with 47 years of sobriety. He called the next thing that happened to me projectile regurgitation. This is a new level of puking I'm unfamiliar with. Because right. we all know normal puking, right? You're out there in the middle of a good drunk. You get that little warning, a little sour taste in the back of your throat. Maybe a little bit comes up in your mouth, and you kind of go, mm. And we all know, based upon experience, we have 30 to 60 seconds to find a bathroom if there happens to be one. If we're driving, we're not stupid. We've learned our lesson the last time. Get the window down, right? Because when you blow it all over the dashboard, it's there for weeks in the ventilation system. You know, and we get pulled over. It's a total blow it to have vomit all over the dashboard. We've learned our lesson, right? But here, normally you get that warning. Here on the antabuse, no warning. It's just, ha! This Linda Blair spray across the room. Thank God the Plaza Hotel is the type of, the type of hotel room where the toilet is in the same room with the bed. It's a design feature, I believe, maybe to make convicts feel more at home upon release. I'm not really sure. Found them, but I 
I found the magic of drinking on top of an abuse, and this is uh, it's important if you're going to drink on top of an abuse. You might you need to hang in there. This is the number one part of it. You got to hang in there. You may need to reach down deep for a level of commitment you don't even know you have. But I found if I kept drinking and kept puking and kept drinking and kept puking for about an hour to an hour and a half, enough of the antibodies would kick out of my system, and I would quit throwing up, and I would just be left with red face, hyperventilating and sweating, and I'm all right with that. So I drank on top of antibodies the last seven months of my drinking. There's no other way to describe this other than desperation drinking. My second, my last drunk, I was left for dead in a motel parking lot in National City. Uh, I was often another one of those three-day drunks. And again, in the, in somewhere in the late in the second day, it seemed like it was a good idea to look for crack cocaine. Uh, and in National City, it crack moves. It's, a, it's you know, you got to keep track of it where it is, right? You got to ask questions. And I was in the middle of asking, where is it at now? And I was on some motel stairs, and uh, all of a sudden, there were lots of fists flying. Right? Uh, they apparently were not mine. And then there was lots of blood flying, and apparently that was mine. And next thing I knew is I came to on an operating table, and I saw men and women with surgical masks with concern looked on their, look on their faces, and they were doing reconstructive surgery on my face, resetting my jaw. And you know when we come out of blackouts, we sort of look around uh, at our surroundings, really for to find out was it a good night or a bad night. And when you come to and there's men and women with surgical masks, that is a bad night. That is a bad night. You know, I got frustrated with you guys when I first got here over the way you were describing coming out of blackouts. You guys were all, you guys kept on saying things like, I'm just so grateful to be sober because I now wake up instead of coming to. It was just so horrible when I would be out there drinking and I'd come to out of a blackout and I'd look next to me and ah, as if you were always the good looking one in the, in that. There's two sides to that story. Last night of drinking, I'm being let out of the San Diego jail, being transferred from civilian authorities back to military authorities, and I was thrown into a military treatment center. I was not thinking of getting sober. The federal government intervened with handcuffs and a military treatment center behind guards. That's what I was put into. Military treatment is a little bit different. How many people have been to treatment? Yeah. Military treatment is a little bit different. They do not care about the legality of the detox period. <clears throat> Literally, third day, we're out there running three miles with Marines running alongside, screaming and yelling, 150 push-ups, 150 sit-ups, run another three miles, and they're yelling at us, God damn it, you're going to be a fighting man again, move it! And then they put us into therapy in the afternoon and say, how do you feel? <laughs> i got to tell you, it's one of the finest treatment centers in the world for one reason and one reason only, because every night they took us to you. They understood the limit of what they could do. They knew they could only se medically separate us from alcohol. They knew they could give us some counseling that any human being could benefit from. But they knew that any chance of our survival was going to come from you guys. So white vans would come, come to the treatment, the military treatment center. Five or six of us would be put into the vans. And out we would go to a different meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous somewhere in the San Diego County area. And I heard the message. And in looking back, why, why didn't I rebel? Why didn't I struggle? I mean, I struggled in a million ways. But why was I able to stay? And I think that the foundation was laid for two reasons. Number one, our book talks about this propitious moment. I think that drinking on top of an abuse for seven months softened my ears up just a little bit for a while. And during that very important 30 to 60 day period where I, my ears were softened up from drinking on top of Andrews for seven months, I think the people in those meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous in the San Diego County area understood who was in the room and they talked about alcoholism and the recovery from alcoholism. And they did it in their own, own ways. And so many of them, so many of them would catch me off guard by throwing really bizarre humor out there, right? And I believe that when we are laughing is when God is able to get right into our alcoholism without, our defenses are down. My defenses to my alcoholism are down when I am sitting there laughing at Hilda. When I'm laughing at Hilda and the story she's telling, that's right when, bam, my soul gets affected and I didn't even give it permission. I got out of that treatment center and I, the only thing I knew what to do was to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that the, uh, at the North Shore Alano Club, the six o'clock gong show meeting. And I'm sitting in the back of that meeting and the truth about my life is I'm 45 days without a drink. I've got a lot of information and I'm physically feeling better 
than I have felt since I've been a young teenager. But there had been no spiritual awakening, spiritual experience, or even a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. What was even more dangerous than that is I did not know I needed one, and even if I knew I needed one, I did not know how that was going to happen. I do not have the will, the wherewithal, the education, the idea of how to do something like that. How do I have this thing you're calling a spiritual awakening? And I knew n- none of it anybody posed with the question. I, 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 I have failed at everything I have done. I'm one of those guys that when you go out for your first job and you've got a resume, they ask things like, what have you been doing since Cub Scouts? Right? Uh, marketing to distri- and distribution. <clears throat> right? I, I, I don't have, right? And what I did not understand is that what was about ready to happen to me by staying in Alcoholics Anonymous, physically staying in a seat in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous as much as I possibly can, something was going to happen to me that is brand new in the history of mankind. When I say brand new, at that time only about 55 years old, now about 80 years old. Never before in the history of mankind has this been able to happen to people like us. And what it is that was about ready to happen to me, the best way I can describe it this way, the best way I can describe it is, you go back to the interaction between Roland Hazard and Carl Jung. You guys know that little interaction? If you don't, you need to know it. And if you don't know at least a little bit of AA history more than Bill and Bob, you really need to. If you've been here more than 90 days and don't know at least a little bit of the history, such as, you know, more than Bill and Bob, know who Silkworth is, know who Roland Hazard, Debbie Thatcher, and the part that Carl Jung played. You've got to get at least that going on to understand what's going on. To not know that and be here very long would sort of be like claiming to be a Christian for a couple of years and then all of a sudden say, There's somebody named Mary involved in this? Really? Hmm, what part did she play? Right? It's really important for us to understand a little bit about the history. And at a certain point, Carl Jung was telling Roland Hazard, you are a chronic alcoholic. This year of therapy we did, uh, sorry, we wasted time, misdiagnosed you, you're a chronic alcoholic, and I, no, Jung wouldn't have said this, but this was true about him, I am one of the most world-renowned psychologists of history, and I don't know what to do with you. And Roland sort of said, oh no, are there no exceptions? And what Carl Jung said was very interesting. He said, I don't know how to produce this in anybody, but I have heard that throughout history, people like you have had drastic and vital rearrangements of their attitude and outlook upon life. I've only heard of these things. I do not know how to produce it. I personally have not seen it, but I've read and seen that Here and there it happened. So what Jung was saying is that throughout history, people like us, the town drunk, were getting sobered. Kind of like a stray kernel of popcorn, right? Poop! One of the drunks would get sobered. And the town would look at him and go, if his name was Joe, Joe, you're sober! He'd go, I am. (laughs) And everybody else in the town would go, how'd that happen? You need to tell us how you did that. And Joe would go, I don't know. I don't know how it happened. Well, you got to come and help my son. You got to help my wife, my mother. Come on, you got to help. I don't, I don't even know what happened to me. I can't help. So Joe's sober, but he's useless. And not only is he useless, he's a bad example to the rest of us drunks. Because now our families are saying, why can't you be like Joe? I guarantee you, in the history of alcoholism, a lot of Joes got found floating down the river. Right? We had to get rid of him. But got, bad example, we got to get rid, rid of Joe. Right? What I propose to you is that what Alcoholics Anonymous is, is that we learned how to mass produce what had been happening randomly in history. We have learned how to mass produce that for the first time in the history of mankind. In the same way that Henry Ford learned how to mass produce the automobile so the common man could have the automobile, we have learned how to mass produce the spiritual awakening for the alcoholic, if you want to have it if you want to have it. So I didn't know that what I was going to be asked to do was turn my will and life over the care of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? It is so, if if we, wouldn't you like to, let's, let's paint this picture. If you were to go up to a new person in some recovery home in your area, right? You go in late at night just before they go to bed and say, hey, new guy, did you live in the essence of step three today? 
they would go, <laughs> and, and then scare them with this. And your life depends on your answer to this question. Right? And they go, oh, I don't know, I turned it over. Uh, I, I, I prayed. Wouldn't it be nice if that person could look back at the old timer and say, yes or no? Right? And it really boils down to this. When you can pose that question to a new person, did you live in the essence of step three? It's literally, did I turn my actions and my thinking over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous? See, I think Alcoholics Anonymous is the most profound thing to ever happen to alcoholics. And for me to search elsewhere, being an alcoholic, for turning my, my life and actions over to is, is ludicrous. It's sort of like this. This is, what I, this is a silly version of the history of AA. I kind of view it kind of this way. Back in the early 1930s, all of the greatest spiritual leaders of all time uh, uh, that are all up there in wherever it is we go after we're gone, and uh, in the early 30s, uh, let's say Abraham was there, Muhammad was there, Jesus was there, uh, Gandhi was there, Buddha was there. They're all there, right? And uh, Abraham decided to call a group conscience. And Abraham said, hey, hey, you guys, we got to chat. We got to chat. Uh, look, at, throughout the last uh, 5,000, 8,000 years, we have given mankind a million different, at least 100 different ways to experience what it is we know. But look at those alcoholics and drug addicts down there dying in the gutters. Do you think, and let's chat about this, guys, do you think they deserve their own specific, unique pathway to God? Or should we just leave it up to them to find their own way? Let's have a little chat. And so they had a group conscience. They started talking and throwing pieces of information in, and Gandhi chimed in, I think, and said, well, if we are to give them their own solution, we, I think we should make part of that solution that they get to incessantly talk about themselves. So they <laughs> threw that in there. Sure, we'll throw that in there. And... They decided that the group conscience went favorably. They decided to give us our own pathway to God. So therefore, then Abraham, I guess, was the head of the committee, and he looked down there and found the stock speculator and the proctologist. Eddie Cochran used to call that odds and ends. <laughs> and boom, right? So if I'm looking for the, a place to seek the care of God, I'm sitting in it right now. I do not need to look elsewhere. That is a Band-Aid version in order for me to move forward in the steps. I swear to you, if you stay here long enough, you will have a much more deep and profound idea of what it really means to turn your will and life over to the care of God. You will have numerous experiences as to what that means or doesn't mean in your life. But if you are new or fairly new, in order to move on to the fourth step, that's all I needed. Turn my will and life over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous. So then you can go to that brand new person and say, hey, hey. Did you, turn your, did you live in the essence of step three? And that new person can look at you and say, I went to two meetings today. I called my sponsor. I read some out of the book. I looked out for somebody that was a little bit newer than me. They could look you in the eye and confidently say, yes, I lived in the essence of step three today. Or almost equally important, they could look at, back at that old timer and say, you know what? No, I, uh, I uh, lied about the number of meetings. I, I didn't go to any meetings. I lied to my mother, I cheated at my job, and I chased girls all day. <clears throat> I will try better tomorrow. At least they know where they stand. At least they know where they stand in their sobriety. Right? That's equally as important as doing well, is knowing when you're not, when you're outside. I'm going to finish with this one last story of what it really means to me. Uh, 17 years sober, I got married. Uh, that was an amazing thing. Uh, we have two beautiful kids, Madison and Ryan. They really are spectacular. A Facebook friend of mine, uh, you know I'm really crazy about them. And I really love them from the depths of my soul. But we got divorced, and we had to figure out a, a reasonable way that we can be good co-parents, right? We have to trade off a lot of stuff, and we do pretty good at it. We do pretty good at it. In fact, I have to leave after Jennifer's talk to go take my son because my daughter has another soccer tournament. My son has a golf tournament. i got to do my part, right? But anyway... Part of the deal was I made a deal with uh, when we f fired the lawyers. Lawyers are a pain in the ass in a divorce, right? Uh, when we fired the lawyers, we made a deal that I would cover the house and, and the finances, and she can be the mom and go to school and do all this type of stuff. And, and it all sums up to kind of like this. As a, this never happened, but I, uh, if I were, they, they lived right behind the 10th green at the country club where I, where I was a member. And if I would have, on a cold California morning, if I would have, this didn't happen, if I would have driven by early in the morning 
and seen my kids outside in the driveway of the house. That I, and you see, the house and the clothes and the car represent my care of my children. Hopefully I show my love for my children in a million different ways, but my care is the house, the car, the clothes. If I drove by in a cold California morning, like 55 degrees or something, right? In other parts of the country, they yell at me right there. So, and I drive by, and my children are out there at 6 in the morning, naked, freezing in the driveway. And what would I do? I'd slam on the brakes, and i go, what are you doing outside? And they'd go, Daddy, Daddy, we're cold, we're cold, we're cold. What are you doing in the driveway? I'd look inside the house. My ex-wife would be in there making breakfast, clothes on the bed, the heat's on. And i go, what are you doing out here? Oh, Daddy, we, we're, we're, we're cold. I said, get back in the house. Get back in the house. How many of us separate ourselves from Alcoholics Anonymous, start dropping our commitments, quit sponsoring, say, get angry at our home group? Oh, easy thing to do. <laughs> you notice the people from Kavina are laughing at me right now. <clears throat> and I separate myself from Alcoholics Anonymous, then I pray to God about my problems. But you've got to fix this and how I'm feeling about that. And boy, the, my work stuff and the kids. And, and I've separated myself from Alcoholics Anonymous. Far be it from me to say what God thinks or does or anything. But I kind of view it as God would look at me out there praying going, what are you doing outside the house? Get back in the house. Then we'll talk about your problems. Have a great day. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.